Jesus Christ, I'm blessed to see you here today, and it's a pleasure to worship with you in this second Sunday of Advent. When my kids were small, we bought an ant farm. Did any of you ever have an ant farm? Or, yeah, and you put the thing together, and you pour the sand in there, and then the ants come in the little test tube, and you're, you're not supposed to shake it, but you look in there, they're, not, they're all like laying on top of each other, and they're not moving. You really want to go like this, because... They're, they're so, I'm thinking, these are all dead, these ants. They just sent us a bunch of dead ants. But as soon as you unscrew the top, they it's like a whiff of fresh air. They climb out and they're going everywhere. We're, we're trying to pick up ants and put them in the ant farm. We must have lost half of them. They, they scatter all over the place. 
I don't know that much about chickens, but reading our gospel text today, Jesus talks about how often he would have gathered his people together like a hen gathers her chicks. And so that's what I picture the chicks doing, just going every which way, right? But Jesus says you would not. The Lord's desire is uh, that we would be gathered together under him, but it's our all will all the time that we scatter off in our own directions. And so we're praying and trusting in the Lord to, to gather us under his wing and uh, under the protection of his grace. Our opening hymn, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, verses 1 through 4, will stand on verse 4. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We spend a moment in silent reflection both upon God's word and for our own self-examination this morning. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most, Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from God and peace among our brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace among all who seek to serve Christ and support his church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who gather here to be strengthened in faith and encouraged in service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. On this second Sunday in Lent, we are reminded that the Lord is rich in mercy and willing to forgive our sins and save us by his grace. But that we are not always ready to approach him in the humility of faith and with a heart of repentance. From the prophet Jeremiah comes the story of how the word of the Lord was met with rejection, anger, and rebellion. In Philippians, the sorrowful Paul recounts the story of those who once believed but now walk as enemies of the Lord. In our gospel lesson for today, we hear the lament of the Lord who wanted to gather his people under his arms of mercy, but they would not. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, the 26th chapter. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death, because he's prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words you have heard. Now therefore, mend your ways and your deeds, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will, will relent of the disaster that he's pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and, you, and upon the city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite all the Sunday school children to come forward and the Sunday school teachers. Come on up, boys and girls. We have a small group today, but they have guilty, they have good voices. Come right on up here. All right. Thank you. 
The epistle is from Philippians chapter 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk accordingly to the example you have in us. For many of whom I often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel. according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox 
Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn, verses 1, 2, 5, and 7. Grace and mercy and peace to each one of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My text is the epistle text, which was read from Philippians 3 and 4. You know what I have here? This is, uh, this is my high school yearbook. And there's my picture down there. I'm the very last picture on the very bottom of the, of the page there. What? You can't, you can't see it? It's too small? <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> I, don't want you to, well, I don't want you to see it. If you could look at it closer, you'd see my hair back then goes all the way down, like where it's almost touching my shoulders. I, I parted my hair in the middle. And I had, remember how they did it in the 70s? You know, it's all kind of feathered back. You know how I did that? My sister taught me how to like, like to do it with the blow dryer. I can't believe what... I, I sat with like a blow dryer on my hair. What was I thinking? I have not, I tell you, I have not touched a blow dryer to my hair in decades since then, that's for sure. I, uh, I also don't wear the same kind of clothes that I wore back then. 
and I had a bicycle, a really nice yellow bike. And when I, I was in junior high, I rode that bike everywhere. And then when I got married, I uh, gave the bike away. And I, I honestly, I don't think I've been on a bike in, in decades. And I had a, a coin collection and I used to lay on the floor and I would spread my coins out all on the floor and I would look at them all. And when I got married again, I traded most of those in. I still have a few coins and to be honest, I, I haven't looked at them in, in probably 20 years. You know what else back then? I used to love Burger King Whoppers. And I think when we were first married, then there was a, the Christians did a boycott of Burger King over something. I haven't, ha I haven't had a Burger King Whopper in 30 years either. So there's a lot of things about me from my youth and my upbringing that I don't do anymore that are, that are changed. But I still adhere tenaciously to the same faith that my parents raised me in. In fact, that's the dominant factor in my life. Uh, Gene Veith wrote a column some years ago about a study that was done on kids who grow up in the church and then leave the faith. Uh, they've done actually lots of studies through the years on those, and the numbers don't always match. There's different variables, but, but it kind of orbits around the same sort of thing. So in the one that he mentions, he says that about 75% of kids who grew up in the church end up leaving the church. And then about half of that 75 into adulthood somewhere, they come back to the church. The other half never come back. One of the things that we observe in our epistle text from Philippians 3, 3 and something to which scripture testifies in many places, is that people can lose their faith, and they do lose their faith. Some intentionally walk away from their faith. Maybe they get older, they get exposed to wrong ideas. Maybe their church and their parents didn't really do a good job of showing how Christianity answers the tough questions in life. And they, they get exposed to evolutionary theory or the neo-Marxism that's in vogue in which the church is the bad guy. And, and so by comparison, their knowledge of Christianity just doesn't allow them to address some of those things. And we're told that many, many people who call themselves Christians don't have what's called a, a biblical worldview. They don't even understand what Christians believe on a lot of these things. And so they intentionally walk away. Or, or maybe they're lured by our society, which is so hypersexualized now. There's so many choices to be made. And then there is the, the postmodern construction of the self. The idea that each one of us, we have to somehow create our own identity. And so for kids who, who didn't have a Christian identity that was very solidly formed, they make choices and they grow up about who they are and what they are and Christ is left out. And so they intentionally walk away from the faith in which they were raised. But I think more commonly than those who intentionally walk away are those who drift away. It's not as much an intentional choice as it is getting caught up in making money or the things that make me happy in life. And so that's what I'm pursuing and the myriad of activities that I get involved in that kind of catch my attention. And so I start to attend church less and less, Bible study less and less, read the Bible less and less, pray less and less, and then less, and then less. And it's gone. And so they didn't intentionally walk away, but they, they drifted away from the faith. And so Paul's exhortation to us in this epistle text is, don't lose your faith. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, stand firm. That means don't be shaken from that faith that you have. Let's look at it together. In verse 17 of the text that Amanda read for us, Paul says, Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have, you have in us. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example. Do you realize how important it is to have good Christian role models? Who are the people that you admire? Who are the people that you look up to and respect? for their Christian faith. I still, to this day, think just about every day about my, my grandfather. He was a Sunday school superintendent for decades. 
and a, a great role model of faith for me. I still think very often about my fifth grade teacher in Lutheran school, um, who went on then to be my Sunday school teacher when I was in high school. I think for three of my four years in high school, he was my teacher. And he was so marvelous because I could see in him that the faith was real. It was genuine. And he showed me how to live out and appreciate and enjoy what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and have faith in him. And oh, by the way, that's one reason why those of you who are strong in the faith, it's important for you to have good and healthy, positive interactions with our kids. We shouldn't have all the, the adults stand around the coffee and all the kids somewhere else talk to them, interact with them. Why? So they can see that your faith is real. Kids need to see faith in action among godly Adults. Remember that Sunday school teacher that I mentioned to you? you know, I, I've only seen him twice in the last 35 years or so. But he called me out of the blue just before Christmas just to see how I was doing and to, to pray with me over the phone. You know how good that felt? And oh, by the way, I just received a, a, a Christian academic journal that I've always uh, kind of wanted. Uh, he and I had talked about it, and I, I found out that he bought a subscription for me after that. So keep your eyes on young people. And, uh, let them imitate you if you are spiritually mature. Invest yourself in them. We need Christian role models. Verse 18 in our text, Paul tells the Philippians with tears. Did you catch that when she read that? With tears that many have become enemies of the cross of Christ. It moves him to tears. That's how passionately he feels for the loss of those who have walked away or have drifted away from the faith. And let's not soften what that entails. It's not as though people who leave the faith now somehow become neutral. When they're no longer walking as Paul walks, he says here, how are they walking? In other words, how are they walking in life? They're walking, he says, as enemies of the cross of Christ. Jesus said, those who are not for me are against me. Everything the cross stands for and means can only be upheld by those who, who embrace it. And so those who have walked away from it may not even realize it, that they have become enemies then of Christ. And why does that move Paul so deeply that, that he comes to tears when he thinks about it? Verse 19 tells us, because their end is destruction. Those who have rejected the cross of Jesus Christ by which he has made himself our sacrifice for sin and atoned for our wrongdoings so that we can be clean and holy in the sight of God and be with him in that holy place, his eternal presence those who leave that face destruction for eternity, being separated from the presence of that holy God. So it's not about boosting church attendance. It's, it's not about getting more people to help with projects around the, the church. It's about the eternal destinies of those who have departed from Christ. He says in that verse that their God is their belly. It's metonymy of aspect there, right? Your belly can be said to be the thing that drives your appetite, your cravings. Your appetite is what you want. And so people have made what I want into their God, God with a small g. The most important thing is their God, and their God becomes whatever it is they crave, whatever their appetite is, whatever they want. And look around us, and you can see all the people that have made that their God. He says they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. When someone's in this condition, the things that they glory in, meaning the things that they're most proud of, the things that they want to hold up in your face and say, look at me, look how wonderful I am, look how wonderful my life is. Those are actually the things that will shame them before God one day because they are earthly things. Oh, look at this new whatever that I bought. Or look at this trip that I took to wherever. Or look at this accomplishment I have in my life and my little pet project. Or look how important I have become uh, in the eyes of so-and-so or such-and-such. But glorying in earthly things, that doesn't last. 
Those things have no eternal value. Paul says in verses 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. When Jesus Christ returns, the scriptures teach that these frail temporary bodies, which will all inevitably wear out and die, they will be resurrected. And we will be changed into eternal celestial bodies like the one Jesus had after he rose from the dead. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're looking for uh, ahead to. And so in the meantime, what we do is we remember that we're not citizens here. We don't really belong on this earth. Where do we belong in that eternal kingdom? This is not our home. This is just a temporary stop, like when you go to a hotel on your way to somewhere else. And when you have that mindset, that changes how you look at everything. It changes how you live. When you f have suffering in your life, when you remember that this is just temporary, you see it differently. When you experience loss in your life, when you remember that this isn't where you live, this is just temporary, it changes everything. I don't belong here. I belong somewhere else in heaven, in God's eternal plan for the fullness of life in which everything will be subject to Christ. And wow, when I'm confident of that, what can the world do to me? And so then Paul tells them in chapter 4, verse 1, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. I remember one time with a group of folks and we were going outside of a building and the, there had been some ice. It had frozen and it was icy outside. And so the first woman walking out the door, she wasn't paying attention. She's talking over her shoulder to the people coming out behind her. And she stepped out of the door onto that ice and her feet went right out from under her. Boom and down she went. And of course your first impulse when someone falls is you want to make sure they're okay. So everyone kind of gathers around her. Are you okay? Are you okay? And then when you see that she is okay, then there's some joking, right? Good thing you landed on your softest part there, right? Uh, uh, but then when we get up, the next person out the door goes out very carefully, right? So when we see someone fall, we want to pray for them. We want to keep witnessing to them. We want to keep inviting them. We want to keep sharing with them. But what's the most important thing when you see someone fall? Make sure you don't fall. Make sure that you stand firm, that you're careful so that your faith remains intact. Amen. I invite you to stand now and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we see how there are those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And so we pray that you would make known your mercies in Christ, that you would call and gather people under your wing, that you would move us and others to repentance, and that you would increase, O oh Lord, the citizenship of your kingdom. Protect us, O oh Lord, from evil, and help us to follow the examples of the apostles, and the examples of the good role models that you have put in our lives who have been godly and faithful people. We ask this in the name of our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Your 
And we pray, Lord, for all the households and friends of this congregation, that every family, O oh Lord, will experience the joy of having you at the center of their home. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would foster deeper love between husbands and wives. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant to children joyfully to obey the commandments and to honor and obey their parents. We pray, O oh Lord, that our homes would be places where we do not follow the cravings of our appetites or glory in earthly things, but where we honor you and set up heavenly things at the center. Make our homes a refuges, refuges and sanctuaries where people find rest, where they find peace, where they find comfort, where they find reassurance. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray that you would work in the nations around the world. Your word tells us that we are to pray for kings and those in authority so that we might have peace so that the gospel can go forth. And so we pray, O oh Lord, for peace around the world and that you would guide and direct rulers to govern in ways that please you and stir up righteousness among the nations. But we also, Lord, know that the, the greatest tragedy is not that people die in war, but that people will die without hearing the gospel. And so we pray in particular for the the churches and places where there is warfare now in Ukraine and Russia, that we pray that the Christians there will be given opportunities and that doors will be opened for them to boldly mention and proclaim the gospel of Christ to others and that you would spread, O oh Lord, this good news among those who need to hear it. Lord, in your mercy. And we remember, O oh Lord, those among us who have special needs because while we await the glorious resurrected body that we shall receive when Christ returns, Lord, we have to deal with these temporary bodies that fall apart and, and trouble us. And so, O oh God, as Christ, your Son, did cures and miracles and cast out demons when he walked upon the earth, so we pray that according to your goodwill and your providence that you would do miraculous things among us as well. We lift up to you then our precious sister Diane as uh, you have heard the many prayers that have gone up for her and how even though her time is drawing near to enter into your eternal kingdom, she's in some ways feeling better. For this we bless you and we continue to pray that you hold her in your hands and that when the moment comes, she will peaceably close her eyes and open them again, staring into the face of her Savior. We pray for those who battle cancer in our midst. We think of Doris and Mark, Roberta, Jim, and Janine, and for Gina, who discovered that she has lung cancer. Lord, we pray for those with various other health concerns, for Gareth and Ron, Chuck and Arlene, Amanda, Donna, Mario, Mark, Stan, Marilyn, for Bob Schneider's mother, for Phil, Lord, for um, those who have had medical procedures, for Marv, for Mike, for Carolyn, for Paul, and for Beth, for those, Lord, with medical procedures coming up, for Lynn, and for Dave, and for Kathy. All of these, O oh Lord, we entrust to you, asking that you would manifest your power in their lives and that Christ will be honored by what you do for them. We also give thanks that you have heard the prayers that have been offered for Ed and for Lena, that both of them have received good news, O oh Lord, that um, health issues are not due to cancer. For this we thank you and we bless you. We entrust to you, Lord, everyone that we name to you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. And Almighty God, while your Son suffered reproach while he walked upon this earth so that he might bear our sins upon the cross, we ask that you would strengthen us when we face reproach for his name and that you would help us to never be afraid but to stand upon this salvation boldly that we have in him. We pray it through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now receive the offer. Rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. So he took the cup when he had supped, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many, for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father...
glory to you, O Lord, for the mercy you have shown to us, for the word spoken in our midst, and for the sacrament upon which we are fed the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As you have gathered us here, we pray you to continue to gather your people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and shelter us in the comfort of your love forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn, Christ be my leader.
that you would like to share. Uh, if it's instrumental, it could be maybe you know playing something during the offering or communion or something like that. Vocalists, um, we we want to start. Um, putting some special music into our services um, a little bit more. And um, so there's a write-up in the newsletter and the Herald, and then there, I didn't make it into the bulletin, I'm so sorry, it's this week. <laughs> um, it'll, there'll be something in next week's about it as well. So check out the daily, the Herald, and um, next week's bulletin. But if you want to come see me, we can um, talk about song choices and stuff. Obviously, we'll have to be um, approved by pastor, and, um, but we'll, we'll plug in. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? And go in peace and serve the Lord.